Okay, I've been trying to make this video for several weeks now. And uh, I've tried to make it once by walking around my property and doing it while walking around. And it's just, it's kind of too encompassing for me to just spout off what's on top of my head. I got to follow some notes to get this done. And not just to have it to where I cover the things that I want to get covered in it, but uh, it, just to make it somewhat timely. It's going to be a long video. And the reason I'm doing this video is someone, uh, one of my subscribers, asked me to expand on a video I had done in the past. She wanted to know what my current thoughts were concerning a video that I did. It was called The End Is Here. Uh, actually, The End Is Near. Scratch it out. The End Is Here. And it's titled Just Another Teotihuacan Video. And the Teotihuacan is just a uh, acronym for the end of the world as we know it for whoever might not know that at this time but I'm gonna go ahead and just dub this over the other video I had of me walking around my property that way it'll have something visual with it uh, but I don't think that video really came together how I really wanted it to so I'm gonna try and uh, I'm going to try and put something together here that I can uh, maybe expand since someone from my community actually asked me to give my thoughts on something. And uh, that doesn't happen very often with my low subscribership. So if someone asks, I'm going to try and do it. I'm going to go ahead and include two literary works on this. And both of these will be very recognizable if they're not. I'll go ahead and tell you exactly what they are. Go ahead and take a listen. I'm going to read them. I'm not a great reader, but hopefully I emphasize the uh, important parts of both of these uh, literary works. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a dissent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute a new government laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right. It is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former system of government. The history of the present King of Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations 
all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. Matthew chapter 24 Jesus left the temple area and was going away when his disciples approached him to point out the temple buildings. He said to them in reply, You see all of these things, do you not? Amen, I say to you. There will not be left here a stone upon another stone that will not be thrown down. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples approached him privately and said, Tell us, when will this happen? And what sign will there be of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus said to them in reply, See that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and reports of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for these things must happen, but it will not yet be the end. Nation will arise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes from place to place. All of these things are the beginning of the labor pains. Then they will hand you over to persecution and they will kill you. You will be hated by all nations because of my name. And then many will be led into sin. They will betray and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and deceive many. And because of the increase in evil doing, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who perseveres to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. You see the desolating abomination spoken of through Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. Person on the housetop must not go down to get things out of his house. A person in the field must not return to get his cloak. Woe to pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days. Pray that your flight not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For at that time there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will be. And if those days had not been shortened, no one would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, they will be shortened. If anyone says to you then, Look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. False messiahs and false prophets will arise, and they will perform signs and wonders so great as to deceive, if that were possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told it to you beforehand. So if they say to you, he is in the desert, do not go out there. If they say he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For just as lightning comes from the east and is seen as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will darken and the moon will not give its light and stars will fall from the sky and the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming upon the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send out his angels with a trumpet blast, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches become tender and sprouts leaves, you know that summer is near. 
In the same way, when you see all of these things, know that he is near at the gates. Amen, I say to you. This generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. For as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. In those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day that Noah entered the ark. They did not know until the flood came and carried them all away. So will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be out in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know on which day your Lord will come. Be sure of this, if the master of the house had known the hour of the night when the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and not let his house be broken into. So too, you also must be prepared, for at an hour you do not expect the Son of Man will come. Who then is the faithful and prudent servant? whom the master has put in charge of his household to distribute to them their food at the proper time. Blessed is the servant whom his master on his arrival finds doing so. Amen, I say to you, he will put him in charge of all his property. But if that wicked servant says to him, my master is long delayed, and begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with drunkards, the servant's master will come on an unexpected day and at an unknown hour and will punish him severely and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. Okay, so both the, both of those are pretty recognizable. One is a portion of the Declaration of Independence. It's the first part of it where they declare their independence, and I just didn't include the portion where they state the evidence that they say they're getting ready to state. Preface to the Declaration is the first part where they state that, you know, you must have a clear statement made from a group or a people who are separating from their known form of government and it must be concise it must be very well stated laid out and it must be important it, might, it can't just be it can't be on a whim and you, it states that in the uh, declaration itself about some of the things that might prohibit might be prohibitive of people doing such a thing like some people are just lazy and they don't want to do it it's too hard it's too burdensome for them to actually go against they'd rather go along with a tyrannical government than have to deal with it and that we see that a lot especially these days a lot of people who i know and i talk to it's like what is taking so long for people to stand up and do something i i firmly believe our government has gone past the point of the tyranny that the, the colonists ex, the, the colonists were exposed to the experienced so anyway I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get into this a little bit the reason uh, what the reason for this video I started making it and I did a, a pretty much a deep dive into the history because I, I really didn't know some things and the part of the uh, video that uh, my, the, the subscriber asked me to expand on it dealt with economics mostly it was when I said the end is here it was mostly dealing with the end not the end of the world 
I mean, I know Tia Tiwaki says the end of the world as we know it, but the end is here. It's the end of our economic age, maybe of our, even our political cycle. I mean, we have cycles that are everything like uh, solar cycles. We have political cycles. We have religious cycles. We have economic cycles. There's cycles to everything in life. But the end being here, this is a pretty big one, and it might be the end of our political and economic cycles that have just run their course and need to be reestablished. Uh, it's, it's quite frightening what people are doing at the top. And, and whenever a government begins to usurp power and they talk about usurpations of power in the Declaration of Independence. It's a it's a taking of power from the people, from the governed to the governors, to the tyrants, to the despots, to those people who are seeking to take from the common man and increase their wealth and coffers and benefits. And it has far exceeded Anything that should be, anything that should be allowed or tolerable, that our leaders, and I'm talking about people in Congress, people in the Senate, well, Congress, the House of Representatives, the Senate, and the executive branch, even there, the judicial branch is totally corrupted. From what I understand, they all get lucrative speaking deals in countries that are directly opposed to us such as China they go there and they speak and they get six figure payouts the person who sits in the executive branch uh, did deals when he was a senator with China and sold them military secrets and military contracts you got people that are likely to be our mortal enemies one day in battle building the circuitry for our war machine. Are, are, what kind of foolishness, stupid is that? Of course they're going to implant kill switches and stuff. Oh, and oh, oh no, that's not happening. You're a conspiracy theory. Are you serious? Do you think for a second, anyone out there, if you're so naive to believe that people wouldn't sell their country's soul for their enrichment, for their uh, to, to enrich themselves to enrich themselves you're, you're, you're retarded you're blind you're one of those people that would rather just for not to look the other way oh don't look to the side and see what's really going on keep having that tunnel vision don't ever look up and see what's getting ready to hit you in your head just keep looking forward and keep chugging you know look there's a football game on look there's someone dancing on TV whatever if you're so stupid to believe that, then I can't help you. And you know what? The Founding Fathers even said, anyone that would be to such a level deserves none of, deserves none of the freedoms they have. So if, they, if people are like this and you want to just keep your head in the sand, you don't deserve the freedoms that other men get, fought for. So what I was trying to uh, research when I did this was... I really wanted to understand how the Founding Fathers viewed taxes because how do the rich steal the wealth from the common man and give it to themselves, mostly through taxes? And one of the things that I see happening right now in, in this world, uh, one of the things I talked about in the previous video was some, some people might want to really know what I think about cryptos right now. I still think cryptos are going to be fine. I'm positioning myself to buy in. But the stuff that happened with the FTX debacle, if you don't know what happened about that, this is exactly what happened. And you can, whatever, if you don't want to believe it or not. Yeah, I don't, it's neither here nor there to me if you believe it or not. But they're sending all of this money over to the big U, to that, to that conflict, to a place that they, before this conflict broke out, that a lot of our politicians went to and brokered deals and different contracts that were, uh, that enhanced their net worth, that were very vital to their personal wealth. 
and they did it in the backyard of a country that absolutely opposes what's going on in this country and I think the 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 other big dog on the block got ticked off with us being in their backyard and pulling all of this crap and was going to put an end to it and that's what started this uh, part partially what started this conflict but anyway it's, it's a part of it but they're sending all of this taxpayer money over there without I don't I didn't I know I don't support it, and everyone I know, every single person I know doesn't support it, but they're sending it over there, and then it just disappears. Send enough money over there to win this dang thing five times over, but from what I understand, that whole con that whole country's dark now and obliterated from its electrical system and its uh, infrastructure is all down, but they took that money and they funneled it back through the crypto exchange, and then they put it back into their own pockets so they were funneling they were just washing the funds it was a it was a laundering the money through a crypto exchange which our government says they hate crypto exchanges and the reason they hate it is because it undermines if the common man gets involved in it it undermines their taxing system but if they use it they can use it to launder large amounts of funds so what they did essentially is they killed two birds with one stone they laundered the money back through a system that they had control of, that they put patsies in charge of, probably the same way they, they did uh, Oswald and uh, McVeigh and stuff and made them think they were doing something right and set them up. Not that I know exactly what happened with all of that, but I'm pretty sure I do. And these poor people probably had, well, they ain't poor people, they're freaking morons. And uh, they, they used them to funnel the money back into their own hands anyway. And at the same time, they get to demonize cryptos in the, uh, in the, uh, in the eyes of the population. Oh, look, uh, cryptos are evil. It's going to destroy our economy. No, they did it. They used one they made up to destroy it. Now watch, cryptos are going to come back because there's decentralized exchanges. And I, I just don't see cryptos going away. And the reason they want cryptos to go away is because they want to enact their own digital currency, which is a, a CBDC, C Centralized Banking Digital Currency, <laughs> CBDC. Uh, they want to have it centralized, and they want to have, if they can centralize it through the Fed and get it started and beat the other countries, they want to they want to own the world with it. They want to make it a global currency just like the dollar with the petrodollar. And we're not going to get into that because I already expanded on that in other ways, in other videos. But I wanted to expand on our country and why we're in such turmoil. And it's because of these corrupt, these absolutely corrupt politicians that are enriching themselves. And it's time... It's far past time that they need to be removed. They, they need. It's far past time that they have exceeded their place in our government as far as rulers. We need to somehow limit them. They need to have term limits when this comes into place. When this gets reset, reset. That there's no way someone should be able to live a life and enrich themselves. How how does some woman go in there and even if she does make six figures a year come out with four or five multi-million dollar mansions no and then someone like trump goes in there and i'm not a big trump fan I, i'm just i'm not a fan of any of these people anymore because i don't believe he did what he said he was going to do um people can fight that back and left and right and front and forwards but um i mean i much preferred him over what we have now but i just I don't think he finished his job and maybe he wants to go and finish it now but you know you had your shot maybe it's time for someone else to take a shot someone who'll do something anyway I don't want to get into that I really don't I really 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 don't I, I don't know I have to see where I go on that but anyway he he went into office and he comes out with less net worth and didn't take a salary and all of these other guys go in come out filthy rich want the, the last Democrat built a freaking compound with all the money he had and all the speaking engagements he does, and they just enrich their family. And this one that's sitting has a freaking vagrant, felonous, despicable son who he keeps 
enriching him. So I'm gonna have to uh, change directions here and just get on with uh, some of the things I was gonna. I wrote some notes down to talk about and uh, when I did this, I wanted to really know what the founding fathers thought about taxes and how how the first finances of the country were put together because I really didn't know much about that outside of maybe some videos I heard on YouTube and what other people just put out there so I had to do a little bit of a dive into it and one of the things that one of the reoccurring themes I found when looking at what the founding fathers were doing just prior to and just after the Revolutionary War was uh, taxes have always been a difficult issue that people just cannot seem to get right. Even the founding fathers, as well as they did, many of them were at odds with each other along the way. And one of the reasons, one of the things that led up to the, uh, there were a number of reasons why the colonists were upset with the British government and parliament, uh, parliament, parliament at the time, was because the British were taxing to increase the military uh, to recoup money from the French and Indian War that they had just gone through. Britain was on the verge of bankruptcy at the time, it seemed like. Well, it was. And uh, the military through the uh, colonies was being... The military and the colonies was being funded through the taxes of the colonies, but the military was also being used to enforce the collection of taxes. So it's kind of a self-deprecating uh, issue here. You, you have this not too well looked upon military who the colonists really didn't like having around forcing them to, enforcing the laws to for them to pay taxes and uh, some of these taxes were just they went, it was the Stamp Act and they called it the Intolerable Acts and it just got to be intolerable uh, it was something they they just they, the taxes were one of the main issues there were other issues of course but taxes were definitely one of the main issues that the colonists were be, beginning to get in an uproar about so there were some writers along the way pre-revolutionary war that were influential it was kind of like a, a precursor to our Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence, written by Thomas Jefferson and a, a few other of the founding fathers, but he was considered the author of it. He spent three days composing it uh, after they got together and discussed it. But uh, it was it was a bunch of ideas that were pre-revolutionary war ideas it wasn't something that was unique just to them and there was a writer uh, John Dickinson and he wrote letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania and there was also the literary work of Thomas Paine which is common sense Dickinson wrote in response to the Townshend Acts which were illegal taxes put on the people and he wrote to unite the colonies, and his letters were attributed to the formation of the First Continental Congress. And then in Thomas Paine, he wrote Common Sense, and that came out, he was writing in 1775, and he published, I believe, in 1776. And uh, it was really an effort to push the colonists into full revolt by writing what, what his writing did and it really did do that he was writing in his in his works that a government should exist for the people and it should be governed by the people it shouldn't be the other way around here and Americans at that time were really frustrated and they were ready to, to they were ready to revolt and they just needed a push and these works these writings were stuff that everybody was reading at the time and it gave them the push to do it and the founding fathers they were pressed with the uh, they were pressed with the need to come up 
with a form of government that included the ideas that would span the course of all the colonies, that would unite all the colonies. At the time, a, a state was considered a country unto itself. And if you have the United States, it's basically they were seen as united countries, each one sovereign unto itself. So they had to come up with something that would unite the people. And the Founding Fathers, uh, two, two different thoughts of government had influences on what they wanted their government to be. And one was a radical Whig theory, <clears throat> and the thought process was individuals in a free society, they need to guard their freedom, and when a government encroaches on that freedom, it is their duty to fight back, and if they don't, they don't deserve that freedom at all. They deserve no freedom. <clears throat> so, you can see that this could lead to mm, a lot of discontent amongst the people if there's no fluency throughout the uh, understanding of what what would be legal, uh, legal aspects, uh, the handling of conflicts amongst people. And it, it just, I, I kind of, in my mind, I see it kind of as an anarchist system. But the radical Whig theory really wants to suppress government. And then they also dealt with what's called the classical liberalism, and it's the Lachian liberalism, and it was a, a formation of government come, that was devised by John Locke, and his works were that the rights, it's the rights of the people, the people have rights, and it's the government's responsibility and the necessity of a government to protect the rights of the people and people under that theory need government that would to in order so that the people would not go out of control so it's limited government just enough to help the people but also you need to know that gov with the weird radical weak theory government needs to be kept in check so it's kind of a, co a, a combining of these two theories and then <laughs> There was a lot more to it. It's just this. This is just a real quick uh, overview, and I'm probably leaving out a lot. And anyone that's a historian, and I mean a true uh, educated and uh, maybe academic of his, history, and says, "Well, you're getting it kind of wrong." Yeah, I, I might be getting it somewhat wrong, but I'm kind of giving you an idea of where it was. The real big idea is our founding fathers had a massive problem in front of them in <coughs> figuring out what kind of government was. And they came up with the Articles of Confederation to fight the, the Revolutionary War under, but it was after, and this was a brutal, brutal war. And, and you have to realize, people, these men who fought this, they went into this war knowing that it was either you win it or you die. And there was no surrender because it's to surrender meant you died. You were gonna die if you surrendered. So they were basically putting all of their marbles, all of, they were putting all of their cards on the table, uh, all their chips on the table, I should say. And uh, it, there was no losing unless you die. You die, you, you lose, you die. You surrender, you die. You win, you win your freedom. So they were in a very precarious situation, but they fought that war under the Articles of Confederation, which were the precursors to our Constitution. But let's uh, let's get into a little bit about that. I'm, I'm you kind of skip a little bit, and I might skip around here and there and jump back and forth in time. But basically, want to talk about. When they were discussing how they were going to write a constitution, our forefathers were not always of the same mind. Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson stood adamantly opposed on the formation of a central bank. And 
Alexander Hamilton thought a central bank was necessary and he was the first Secretary of Treasury under George Washington and he just didn't I, I think he realized it might have scared him to a point that he knew the nation needed money and the only way to get money to pay off the debt for the Revolutionary War was to through a taxation method and they tried different taxation methods and they really didn't get it right. One of the things that uh, Washington, Jefferson, and even Hamilton uh, mostly agreed on, Hamilton was a little bit more, he was, he was a Federalist in, uh, to separate, the, there was the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, and Thomas Jefferson stood on the Democratic Republican side, and uh, Alexander Hamilton was a Federalist. And he was, they, the Federalists were more apt to, in, to using taxation as a way to get money for the government. And Jefferson, he was not opposed to a central bank in, in total theory, but he did say that nowhere in the Constitution does it allow for or even state that can be a centralized bank in the United States. And Alexander Hamilton said, well, it's implied that we need to have something to fund the government. And the way to do that would be through a centralized bank that collects taxes and they didn't know how to do there were regressive taxes there's regressive taxes and progressive taxes regressive taxes are like a tax that everybody pays the same amount no matter what your status in life your your wealth in life say it's five dollars i'm just going to make up five dollars for whatever widget and everyone pays it no matter what whether you are worth a hundred dollars or worth a hundred thousand dollars well that tax hurts the guy who's only worth a hundred dollars much more than the guy who's worth a hundred thousand dollars so what they did what what you have is progressive taxes which more like our income tax now where the more you make the more you pay but we all know that crooked politicians get away get get away from paying taxes and certain uh, giant corp corporations can get out of paying taxes uh, and it's mostly the common man who can't get out of paying taxes that pays the most most even though it's supposed to be a progressive tax it's not uh, certain people get to get out of it based on their status which is corrupt anyway we know that we're not going down that road I'm just trying to explain a tax system but they first they like they would go in and enact property taxes and they said uh, we're going to enact property taxes based off of if you own over 40 acres of land, each acre over you're going to pay, say, $5 per acre in taxes. And uh, but, but that didn't go over well because some people owned land that produced a lot of money and had an income off of it, made money on it, and some people... Uh, had land that was like swamp land and didn't wasn't really worth much. It, it, it wasn't worth anything, and they were paying the same taxes. So that didn't work out. Um, they just they had to come up with a proper way of taxing because they had to pay for this national debt that they accru that they accrued from the the, the the war. And in fighting all of this, one of the things that Washington was quoted as saying was the best way to secure the economy of a nation is through peace. And what he meant by that was to avoid war at all costs because wars were where you expanded the national debt. And they also said that the national debt is to be paid for every year and it is not to go over and be carried over to the next year. And taxes this is another thing the founding father said taxes should only be as much as what I might have said this already should only be as much as what the government needs to run itself they could be an inconvenience and uh, a, a, a slight burdensome on the person but it should never be anything more than that 
uh, I think the other word is different, but it should never be more than a slight inconvenience. If it's more than that, then it's too much. And we know taxes are way more than a slight inconvenience to the common man. So anyway, they knew that you were never supposed to tax as much as what we're being taxed now. Taxes were never supposed to fund wars that we're not supposed to be a part of. And you should avoid them at all costs, which we don't. We start them up at the drop of a hat. If there's some natural resources or some oil we want, we'll start a war for it. If there's some politicians that need to get their, their uh, coffers filled, we'll start a war, definitely. Yeah, let's, uh, let's send some young men over there and, you know, they, they'll die for freedom to get money for the politicians. Yeah, right. Anyway, we all know that. We don't have to go into that. That's despicable. It's what they're doing is horrid. And it's against what the principles of this country were founded for. And that's our, our forefathers told us. And the part, part of the uh, Declaration of Independence where, let me see, it's going gonna, it's gonna to say, Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. So you never... You never go against your government for uh, just how, how what light and transient causes should be self uh, self evident what it means, but you just don't do it on a whim. You have to have a good reason to do it, and this is the part where, and accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. Which means people are more likely to just go along with what's happening, whatever. And this was part of what Dickinson and uh, Payne wrote. If you don't fight for your freedoms, then you don't deserve them. Because men are more likely just to go along with the status quo rather than stand up and fight for their freedoms. You see this in so many people out there. And that's where you come up with the term sheeple. They will just follow along. Oh, man, I don't really don't want to cause any waves. Because the government will come after you or you, you'll be called a, a, a radical or you'll be villainized. If you don't, if you do rise up and say something but I have noticed more people are starting to get tired of it and they're starting to say something so you people and this is what they said Dickinson said if you don't fight for any of your freedoms or really what he said is if you allow any of your liberties to be given away you deserve none of them you don't deserve any of them and we have allowed our liberties to be given away uh, through that lockdown that was taken away of our liberties. If they do it through uh, emergency orders, that is the worst way that you can lose your liberties because you never get them back. Uh, emergency orders for a war. We need to send money to this war. And that's what they're doing right now. We need to emergency lockdown. You're giving up your three. And this is what the founding father said. If you give them up, you don't deserve any of them. So do you understand this? Do y'all see what's going on? We've already fought for this. And now here we are back at the same situation. It has to end. It's going to have to. History is going to repeat itself. If you understand what I'm saying. You cannot let them take away our rights. If you, if you do, you deserve none. Now... <sighs> When they were discussing how they were going to charter the, uh, when the the Constitution of the United States, they Thomas Jefferson, who was really a critical part of, uh, they all were, they were a critical part, but Thomas Jefferson was very much a voice in the in the first parts of uh, the the creation of the laws of our of our country. He was somewhat against messing with the Articles of Confederation because he said if you create a charter you create more words in which people could probably uh, this is kind of uh, this is kind of uh, just ad-libbing what he said I'm t this is not exactly this isn't exactly how he said it but this is what he meant uh, 
if you change the words, if you add too much wording to it, you're just going to allow for people to make wrong inferences on what the words mean. Keep it simple, stupid is basically what he was saying. Uh, if people don't understand that, the KISS principle. And uh, to, to just expound on it would leave it open to false interpretation. But at the same time, all of the founding fathers said that there is unwritten intent and meaning in the articles and in the, the Constitution, the laws of the Constitution, that you must be able to understand. And also, the Constitution is supposed to be amendable, but only amendable in the situation where, such as in the Declaration of Independence said, not for light and transient causes. You do not just take this on a whim. You cannot change the laws on a whim. You have to have a very unique, uh, a very, not a very broad and understanding reason, uh, understood reason amongst the populace to do something. You don't go crazy. Uh, all this stuff right now, what we're saying, the Constitution protects and all. Our, our founding fathers would have dropped it, dropped their jaws if they would be see us fighting over uh, gender and cultural appropriation and 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 stupid stuff like this. I mean, I don't care what side you stand on in this. It's stupid. Um, I get into a little bit of culture maybe a little bit later if I feel like it, but I have something to say on that, but I might not get into it. I don't know. But in the, one thing they said when we Jefferson was adamant about was that if we're going to write this Constitution, we have to have a Bill of Rights, something that assures that the people maintain the power. They have to have it to maintain the power. This has to be the, the inalienable rights. We have to have it so that they secure their liberty, life, and uh, pursuit of happiness. They always can have that. And one thing was, uh, you know, freedom of speech, and that is under attack like crazy these days. Freedom of speech is mostly done through the Internet, and people are very much canceled if they don't write which is culturally appropriate right now or uh, generally correct or uh, some critical theory or some BS that some other person gets all butthurt over because they don't like the way you say something. Whatever. So we lose in freedom of speech. Freedom of religion. If you're a Christian, psh, you should, you're a crazy person. It used to be that that was the predominant, uh, the, the predominant thought that you know, people of this country were. And I understand that we have to have freedom of religion. But freedom of perversion? No. That is not what it was intended. And some of the perversions that are being done in direct opposition to what is common good religion you know what's good, you know what's bad. And the people are normalizing their perversions. The same people who are taking our money through these taxes are normalizing their own weird perversions through the villainization of religion. Villainizing religion. That's just, just unbelievable. And then one of the big ones, and we always know, uh, the right to bear arms. Our forefathers knew how important it was to have a militia, a regulated militia, and they're not talking about the National Guard, they're talking about the people who have the ability to pick up arms when the government gets out of control and they need to fight it back. They have to have armaments as equal to that government so that the government cannot overpower the people and force them into servitude. And I, I don't people say that, oh they didn't have ARs back then, they didn't they didn't talk but yeah, they were mean in that. They, they mean we have to have the exact military the powers that our military, uh, the exact armament powers that our military does in order to fight it. And that's why Joe Biden's like, I don't understand why all these people, you know, they, they think they need ARs to, uh, to, to, to ward off the government. What do they think? They're going to be able to pull, push us back? We have nuclear weapons. He said stupid stuff like this. What does he mean, we? Who's we? The government? That's exactly what the Second Amendment was saying, so that we can go against them if they get out of control. And he's like, what, are you seriously uh, intoning that you're going to use, implying that you're going to use 
nuclear weapons against us or, or fighter bombers or, or, or fighter jets. This is out of control. They're suppressing us. Anyone who cannot see this is blind, blind, blind. And they are not a part of what this country was meant to be. The Founding Fathers directly stated how things should be. And if things got away from this, away from the governance of the people, the, governor, the government by the people and for the people, then we, it is our duty. It's our right and our duty to abolish that government. And if we don't, we don't deserve liberties or freedoms or any of those inalienable rights. And, you know, con Congress is, both houses are corrupt now. There's no side. I mean, they make money with backdoor deals. They suppress the citizens to enrich themselves. That's usurpation. They take the powers away from the people. And that's mentioned in the, in the Declaration of Independence. And they give the masses some security at the expense of their vast amounts of liberty. And we're just going to end up in a military state where they're going to, just like what the British were doing to the colonists, there will be a military state. This is what pushed them over the top. This is the thing that pushed them over the top. So, we're, we're, we're just, we're beyond that point. So, then what, one of the things that happened after um, the Revolutionary War and this gets to be about the times when I think around John Adams and stuff up, uh, well, the end of Washington's presidency and John Adams. One of the things uh, Thomas Jefferson said is uh, whenever the general government assumes undelegated powers, it acts in an unauthoritative void and of no force. So whenever your government assumes powers that it shouldn't have, they should be considered void and of no force, and the people should not follow those unlaw unlaw unlawful orders. Um, at, the, at this time, when he said that John Adams is the president, and he's a Federalist, and uh, they're enacting uh, laws that go against the Constitution. There was uh, one particular, two particular... Uh, it was the Alien and the Sedition Acts, and Thomas Jefferson was very much against these. As, as November 10th, 19, 17, November 10th, 1798, uh, Kentucky and Virginia, which was uh, James Madison over in Virginia and uh, Thomas Jefferson in Kentucky, they uh, they were they were adamantly against this. Adams, John Adams, was worried about a weakening government, which he's trying to strengthen government through unlawful acts and these acts one of them was they could deport any non-citizen that they wanted to at any time for any reason whatsoever and the sedition act was you could be arrested for speaking against anyone in the government or anyone uh, negatively about the government or anyone in the government or saying anything negative about the president <laughs> could you imagine that this did well I mean we all talk in negative but that that was, that was the laws at the time and they were trying to increase the strength of the government and they were the alien acts at the time and the sedition acts were because they were trying to incite fear from the French at the time the French that had helped us win the, the revolution war they were coming back and they were trying to say the French might be coming to start a war with us so they were trying to increase the government's power and they were trying to use the fear of certain things lack loss of security to enact these laws so you see what they were doing with, with the, the presidency of John Adams and with people like Thomas Jefferson led to when the next presidency, the presidential elections, uh, Thomas Jefferson ran with uh, Aaron Burr as his running mate. And the way the presidencies worked then is uh, whoever, whoever received, like you, you have a running mate, and whoever received the most amounts of the party they won, and whoever out of those two, which are running mate, received the most electorates, 
you won the presidency. Well, both Aaron Burr and uh, Thomas Jefferson both had the same amount of electorates, and it was up to the House of Representatives through their electorate, through their uh, through their vote to see which one of them would be the president. And Alexander Hamilton, who was actually mostly directly in opposition to Thomas Jefferson, was pretty much mortal enemies with Aaron Burr, because we all know that Aaron Burr later on challenges him to duel, shoots Alexander Hamilton and kills him in that duel. But Alexander Hamilton, and part of, part of that was because Alexander Hamilton pushed the electorate for Thomas Jefferson, and that's how close that race was. Thomas Jefferson became the president, and the person with the second amount, which is Al Aaron Burr, became the vice president. Well, anyway, that's just a little history on that time. But anyway, that's how that's how that worked out. So, even though Jefferson and Hamilton saw a direct opposition, and they were of different political parties, they actually, you know, they they were founding fathers and they were both very instrumental in the, the formation of how our governments were. So anyway, uh, Jefferson made it clear that his position of the federal government is a limited role over the states and that the states had to res retain their power. And the government had, but he also said the government had definite certain rights, but it was a general government for special purposes. It wasn't to be the the almighty ruler. It definitely had oversight, and that it's it's that definitely needed to be a separation between what the states ruled and governed and what the the uh, the federal government had over the states. But each state would retain its own self government, and that's what we, we basically have that today. But it's the federal government has definitely over exceeded its boundaries and we all know that and uh the original founders defined tyranny as a government without limits and we are already starting to go down that road we we know with the founding fathers defining tyranny as a government without limits we have a government without limits they do not live they are just it's crazy in your face these days what they'll do to us and if a government goes against the authority for which the people have given it, the government is void. That's that's the words of our founding father and Thomas Jefferson, and the, the that's also the thoughts of most of the founding fathers. That's that's what they they wanted. And Jefferson went on to say that a government cannot give power to itself beyond the Constitution. If it does this makes that power void. This is where they make things legal, but it's unlawful. They make they make their own laws that are in direct contrast to what the Constitution says. If they do it, then that is void. You can't do that. And it's up to the people to keep them in check. Um, and James Madison also went on to say there is a precedence of the people for a refusal to cooperate when those in government go against the meaning of the Constitution, even if those legislatures, legislators are acting within the Constitution. So, what that means, if they're acting within what the words say, but they are, they're doing something that isn't exactly what that means, and this is where people use words this is what jefferson was scared of that they might use more words to pervert the meaning what the meaning of is and the intent is of the law but people pervert the words in a way such to to make it suit their own needs which goes against the people then it's not that they they put they said this so that people would know if this happens you cannot do it it's a void and i'll read that again there is a precedence of the people for a refusal to cooperate when those in government go against the meaning of the Constitution, even if those legislators are acting within the Constitution. I think I said that. I think you understand what I'm saying. If they do something in a perverted way, but they're, they're perverting the, the meaning, then it's, a, it's, it's the people's 
is for the people to refuse that. And what you see happening here is often when the governments do this, they'll do it in such a way the government may be using their power within the Constitution to give themselves more power. And this is what the usurpation of power is. It's what they base the Declaration of Independence on. The government, the parliament, the British government was using their power to increase their power over the people. James Otis Jr., I think he was the one that coined this, no taxation without representation. I'm pretty sure it was his, his words. But he also said, nothing would destroy liberty better than to tamely submit than nobly assert and vindicate our privileges. You have to, these guys had a, master, a masterful way with saying things. And this is so strong. Nothing would destroy liberty better than to tamely submit than nobly assert and vindicate our privileges. It's basically the same theme. If you, if you lay back and do nothing, you lose your liberty. So what I wanted to, uh, uh, basically I've, I've talked over this. It's going way too longer than what I wanted to, but I knew this would be a long video. I want to put in a couple other uh, excerpt, uh, a couple other clips that I, I have. One's a video. This guy is a rev this guy is a renegade. I would have never listened to this guy's music if I would just look at him. But listen to the words of this song. Uh, it's a it's hard to say it's a song, but this artist, he what he's saying. If you don't feel what he's saying is right. It's a revolution. He says he's leading a revolution. And I got to go along with this guy. He, I wouldn't let him in, in my house if I didn't know who he was. But this guy, he has qualities that are admirable and virtuous. And to look at him might scare small children. But I really have to admire his words and his work and his stance against the system. So go ahead and listen to the system. Welcome to the world, baby boy. I'll paint you red and white and blue. The indoctrination starts as soon as you come out the womb. Pretty quick, we'll make you stupid with curriculums at school. And if the classroom doesn't do the trick, we'll make you watch the news. Pick your team, right or left. Pick the red pill or the blue. You can vote, but even if you win, still everyone will lose. Don't forget to buy designer because Gucci makes you cool. We prioritize material belongings over truth. Get a job that you can't stand so you can buy some cans of food. Go overseas and die for freedom. There's some oil we can use. Our democracy exists so that you think that you can choose. But our algorithms make you do what we want. You to do. What's the problem? You're depressed. Society has you confused. We got medication for you that you'll probably abuse. Go get married to a lady who also don't have a clue. And pop out a few babies that are just the same as you. Welcome to the system. Everyone's a victim. Doesn't matter if you're black or white. It hates you all. Here inside the system. Violence is a symptom. Fighting for what's right, but somehow everyone is wrong. Welcome to the system. Everyone's a victim. Doesn't matter if you're black or white. It hates you all. Here inside the system. Violence is a symptom. Welcome to the world, baby girl. I'll paint you pink if that's okay. We'll encourage self destruction through the music that you play. We divided out of men by trying politics and race, and honestly, it's working awesome. So for you, we'll do the same. Never teaching you to love yourself, inject you full of hate. Objectify your sexuality, then blame you for the rave. And weaponize the differences that make our men and women great. And just to screw with you, erase the genders. Everyone's the same. We'll empower you with rights to vote and fight for equal pay. Then have the men turn into women, and you'll fight for them again. But you thought you had it figured out, but everything has changed. Welcome to the system. Please enjoy your stay. Here's a Bible and a bottle of the cheapest booze we make. Find a man who can take care of you to fill the holes we make. Buy a house and settle down, fulfill your duty, procreate. And make a couple babies who will also do the same. Welcome to the system, everyone's a victim. Doesn't matter if you're black or white, it hates you all. Here inside the system, violence is a symptom. Fighting for what's right, but somehow everyone is wrong. Welcome to the system, everyone's a victim. Doesn't matter if you're black or white, it hates you all. Here inside the system, violence is a symptom. Fighting for what's right, but somehow everyone is is wrong. Welcome to the world, everybody. I'ma paint you black and white. I'ma make you hate each other so that everyone will fight. I'ma give you 
you our religion, let the righteous find the light, but I will also give you science to oppose the word of Christ, and I'ma give you borders, they're imaginary lines, if you cross them, go to war and win when everybody dies, and I'ma give you money that you'll value more than life, and let the 1% have everything while you fight to survive, and then I'll give you politics, I'll call it left and right, and while you divide yourselves, I will conquer both the sides, can't you see, I'm the system, my whole purpose is divide, what you choose will never matter, because everything is mine. Welcome to the system, everyone's a victim Doesn't matter if you're black or white, it hates you all Here inside the system, violence is a symptom Fighting for what's right, but somehow everyone is wrong Welcome to the system, everyone's a victim Doesn't matter if you're black or white, it hates you all Here inside the system, violence is a symptom Fighting for what's right, but somehow everyone is wrong Welcome to the system, everyone's a victim Doesn't matter if you're black or white, it hates you all Here inside the system, violence is a symptom Fighting for what's right, but somehow everyone is wrong <laughs> pretty pretty hard pretty pretty raw and uh this next clip is uh milton friedman he's an economic he's an economist and uh mid 20th century that was very influential on the common uh writings of how our taxations and our economic laws were written under certain presidents especially Reagan uh, and, and even earlier but his views were I, I agree with some of them I don't agree with some of them but I thought this was very in 1998 this is when this is from I thought it was very telling that he had the foresight to see what would be uh, digital currencies more than likely the the formation of bitcoin which is uh he i kind of wondered i wonder like is he satoshi nakamoto uh that that's who the uh so-called inventor of bitcoin is <laughs> no one really knows who that is some people thought it might have been greenspan but it might have been this guy because he's actually talking about it and i just thought it would be interesting for y'all to hear this uh premonition of what's coming he knew it was coming. At the close of the 20th century, there are many critical battles facing America. Entrepreneurs versus the courts, children versus bureaucracies and teacher unions, taxpayers facing 40% plus tax burdens. Given that all these vital and quite difficult battles revolve around freedom, we asked Dr. Friedman whether he was optimistic or pessimistic as we enter a new money. You're asking a very complicated question. I think there are two two reasons to be optimistic. One is that ideas have changed. The rhetoric 50 years ago was very different from the rhetoric now. 50 years ago, the rhetoric was that everybody was a socialist. All intellectuals were socialists. They all believed that government was the answer to every problem. Today, nobody believes in socialism if you listen to it. That's the rhetoric. The reality we are much less free now than we were 50 years ago. Government is bigger, takes a larger fraction of our income, it imposes more controls on us. We are freer in some dimensions. There's been great social progress in tolerance of minorities. Our racial problem has been much improved, not, not through government, but through private activity. But nonetheless, that rhetoric will pass is having its effect. There has been a reduction in government price and wage regulation, the kind of thing, the deregulation of airlines, deregulation uh, of uh, uh, communication. But what we have tended to do is to replace that by social regulation, uh, aid to disability, the OSHA, OEUC, that kind of environmental thing, that kind of thing. So the question is, will the rhetoric, will the change in intellectual ideas carry through and produce a change in actual policy? I think there is a tendency for that. That's one source of optimism. But I think a much more uh, reliable source of optimism is the growth of the Internet. In your area, the major, factor, the major effect of the Internet will be to make it harder for government to collect taxes. Governments can collect taxes best on things that don't move. Land is 
an ideal basis of taxation because you can't take it away. <clears throat> individual states cannot go as far in taxing individual personal income as the federal government can because people can move from one state to the other more, re more easily than they move across countries. <clears throat> the internet is going to make it very difficult to collect taxes on services of all kinds. After all, you can complete these transactions in cyberspace, not on the ground. You can, uh, you can, uh, uh, computer companies now are getting their uh, programming done in India. I doubt that anybody's paying any taxes on any of that. So that I think that the internet is going to be one of the major forces for reducing the role of government. The one thing that's missing, but that will soon be developed, is a reliable e-cash, a method whereby on the internet you can transfer funds from A to B without A knowing B or B knowing A. The way in which I can take a $20 bill and hand it over to you, then there's no record of where it came from. And you, you may get that without knowing who I am. That kind of thing will develop on the internet and that will make it even easier for people to use the internet. Of course, it has its negative side. It means that uh, the gangsters, the people who are engaged in illegal transactions will also have an easier way to carry on their business. But I think that the, the tendency to make it harder to collect taxes will be a very important positive effect on the internet. And uh, about the system, you know, one thing is, this system we're in has made it to where the, the genders are all fluid. They, they, they could have men claiming to be females, or you can take on any gender or pronoun. It, 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 they, they fought for this and elected some of these, not all women, I'm just saying some, but a lot of females fought for this gender equality kind of stuff. And now that you have gender fluidity, you have men claiming to be females, and they're taking away from the uniqueness in the identities of women, especially in women's sports now. You see that with that Leo, whatever, whatever that is taken away from college, collegiate swimming. These women fought to have their own stage to be on. And now here comes men and we're, they're, oh, I'm a woman. And, and kicking them straight out. They, they have, they, they took their uniqueness away from him. And he'll just say he's a man who is now a woman who identifies himself. Well, who's to stop a man from coming in and taking over the uniqueness of a woman's ability to be her own athlete and her own, her own sport and saying, okay, I'll, a guy comes in I'll be I'll say I'm a woman and then I'll say I'm a lesbian and then I can compete in their sport but I still get to date women and it means I still like to look at women but I get to go in their locker rooms what 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 what, what? this perversion that has gone on has to stop and this is the kind of things that they're promoting through legal legal legalities which is the perversion of our Constitution. These things aren't lawful. It's, it's definitely not. The intent wasn't to have this done. And I gotta say, each culture in this world with cultural appropriation, I'm gonna just maybe tie, I hate going down this road because everyone who has a culture has a right to their own culture. And I believe each person is unique and different and be able to, it should be able to hang on to their uniqueness. And just because another culture does something that celebrates a different culture doesn't mean we're appropriating it. If you want to look, if I want to, if I want to wear Asian dress or something like that, the Asian clothes to celebrate an Asian holiday or a Mexican hat to celebrate a Mexican holiday doesn't mean I'm trying to become a Mexican or an Asian. It means I just want to celebrate in their uniqueness. And if someone wants to wear lighten hoses and drink some uh, a stout 
Hebelweiss no Whitney in October means you might be celebrating some German heritage or something like that. And boy, I love a good stout Hebelweisner. Ooh. But one thing I want to say is that the government tries to separate us and get us to fight amongst each other based on culture, race, gender. Anything they can get us devised on, devise, devise, devisable on, divisive on. But then they also are trying, they're trying to eradicate certain cultures. And one of the things I see them promoting on TV, and let me tell you, I certainly don't mind, I don't, if a man from this culture truly loves a woman from another and the woman from another one culture falls in love with a man from a different culture. Love knows no bounds. It absolutely knows no bounds. And that's fine. I don't see any problems with that. If you're in love and you love the other, you're going to have a wonderful relationship. You're going to make a wonderful family. But I do know that our government and our and these large media corporations are promoting intermixes. Let me just go ahead and do an experiment for me. Go to your kitchen and take two glasses of water and take your darkest food coloring dye you have and drop five drops into one cup of water and take another cup of plain water and then pour half and half into another glass and look what happens then take another fresh glass of water and take that half and half you just poured and pour half of each of those the fresh glass of water and the fresh glass of the half and half into another glass and see what happens and do this Ten times. Where does the color go? What happens? Do you think they're not trying to make something disappear in this world? Do you think they're not trying to take away, not appropriate, but to take away something? I'm not trying to start any kind of racial divisions here because I think races ought to be proud of themselves. I'm proud of mine, and anyone who is of another race should be proud of theirs. I love watching Muhammad Ali. I saw an interview. If I can find it, I might even include it in here. And they, they asked him, one of the interviewers asked him a question about his race, and he said, I love my race. I would never, I would never give it up. He's like, black is beautiful. He goes, I am a beautiful man. You know, or I don't know what the exact words. I'm gonna have to look up the. Uh, I'm gonna have to look up the video and see if I can find it. But he said he would never sacrifice his color. He thinks it's beautiful, and it is. Why not be proud of who you are? You should be proud of who you are. I d I don't see any reason not to be. So in closing. And I need to close this up because it's going way too long. Our founding fathers knew that there would be a time when our country would be at odds with the government again. That time has come. We need to fight those people who are doing this to us. We have to, we have to see them and recognize them. Open your eyes and Look them in the eyes and know who the evil, know, know who the enemy is. Start talking about it. Start not being afraid to talk about it. I wanted to add about the Founding Fathers. The necessity, one of the things they expound on is the how great it is to be a farmer. George Washington even stated... <clears throat> He goes, before I was a general, I was a farmer. And after 
being a general, he will go back to being a farmer, and he was always a better farmer than he was. He was a farmer. He states that he was a farmer before he was a general. <clears throat> and when they determined where they were going to put the capital for the United States, the United States, it was thought that it must be put in areas that were of a common land to farmers. And, you know, uh, one more thing I wanted to say. When they discussed who had the right to vote, it was only men of age, I think 21 years old, who owned 40 acres or more or had a dwelling on it of 12 by 12, at least 12 by 12, and improved. And you couldn't have a mortgage on your land. You have to have it owned outright. Now, some of the, there might be some other restrictions, and I might have them a little wrong, but they, they made it sure that you must be a landowner of land of value, of, of substantial land. And they were saying, this is how important farmers are. So they knew the importance of farmers. And in today's time, I, it's funny who the who's the government who the government are going against going after the most and that's the hard working farmers the people who produce our food wow gives you something to think about when I didn't go into the religion aspect of this too much but I included Matthew 24 in reading in the first part and one of the reasons I wanted to include this is because it talks about the end times and we all need to be preppers and prepared that's why I became a prepper and then uh, trying to learn homesteading this chapter of the Bible it, it serves to alert us what will be what we'll see in the end times actually at the beginning of the end times and very very few places do we have something that tells us what to expect and you you can see through these passages many of these things and you can interpret this over a long course of time there's always been wars but the wars now circumvent the globe we're globalized it seems to match a little bit better at least I mean and maybe it's just our generation sees it and the generations past saw it but we see other things happening at the same time uh, the climate changes volcanoes going off there's things happening and one of the things that says you will know when you see him, be aware of false prophets, be aware of people who come in my name. You'll, but when he comes, when Jesus comes back, you will be no misunderstanding if it's him. So if you see someone and you're not sure, well, it's not him. But this tells you that these things will start happening, and it will. It will be a harbinger of the end of an age. It will just be the beginning of the birth pains. How a mother goes through. So, if it's the beginning of the birth pains, we still have the entire labor to see through. When uh, nations will fight against, when a nation will fight against a nation, a kingdom will fight against a kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes we are definitely seeing famines now that are biblical in nature that's definitely happening uh, as much as the media doesn't show it we're just seeing it people are reporting it earthquakes are happening in numerous areas we had one of the strongest volcano eruptions in in modern history last year we saw that and it says that all of this is only the beginning of the birth pains so I'm sure some biblical authority could do something on that timeline with that 
if it's only the beginning of the birth pains, we still have the entire labor to go through here. So what this tells me is Jesus is telling his disciples so that it would be written down for others to read. We have to be prepared. We have to have a house in order. And this is going to be a very hard time. It said, if not for shortening of the days, the elect, who are the people of the chosen, the, the people who are of God, wouldn't even be able to stand these tribulations that are going to happen because they're going to be that bad. So they have to shorten the days. Wow. There's a lot in there for that. And it even has a mention, as it was in the day, in Noah's day, so will it be when the Son of Man comes. Noah, who is the, he's the primary prepper of the Bible, him and Joseph. Noah prepared for hundreds, for Noah prepared for many, many years before the floods came. God basically told him to be a prepper. <laughs> So that's one of the things that you have to look at here in these passages. Jesus is warning us of the end times, but not to be confused that the end times are going to take a while. This is just the beginning when you start seeing the signs. And it won't be until the day we really know. So prepare your house. Get your house in order spiritually, mentally, intellectually, physically, you have to be in order. Be aware. Watch out for the thief in the night. Be aware. Be prepared. He says that. If the master knows when the thief will come. And if you also, he tells uh, the, the servant, be prepared for when the master comes. Because if you aren't prepared, the master can come at any time for you. And if you're not preparing yourself properly in all ways, then you're going to see an angry master. But if you are a good servant and you prepare properly, and this is in all facets, then the master will be happy with you. And we have to be ready for this. We have to come together. That the last, one of the last parts is so important that when he talks about if the master knows when the thief will come, he can avoid, he can stop the thief. And I'm, I'm pretty sure what he means is he can take the thief out. A big part of that is saying be prepared. We have to be prepared. We have to arm ourselves with knowledge. We have to be ready physically, spiritually, intellectually. We have to know. And we have to spread this word. Some of the biggest things that you see from the past, men used to com congregate with each other. From this biblical passage, Jesus was talking to the men he congregated with. They had conversation. They talked about the biggest things. His 12 disciples, the founding fathers, would come together, congregate, and talk about what needed to be done. We need to start talking with each other again. We need to come together and have these harsh discussions. We need to start talking about the resolutions possibly a revolution.